In this video, I'm going to be walking you through my general approach to reading a head CT. For more educational resources like our HP notebooks, check out medicalbasics.com. In this case was provided by casestacks.com. Be sure to check them out for different x-ray, CT, or MRI practice cases. But essentially, when I first pull up a head CT, obviously you're going to be wanting to look at um, you know, the history because depending on whether this is a stroke or a trauma or whatever it may be, you're going to be looking at things a little bit differently. But let's just say this is a general patient who comes in, they have a headache, right? So what may you be looking for in that situation? You know, you're going to be wanting to look for a stroke, a bleed, any type of mass or things like that. So when I first pull up the, his the, the case, I'm just going to scroll through it, kind of looking at things globally, see if there's anything major that's going to stand out. I'll maybe make one pass through and look at the, the left and I'll go down and look at the right and then I'll kind of look at them more um, kind of in terms of symmetry because in, in neuro but also in, in, in general you're going to be wanting to look for symmetry. That's going to be the main thing. So the next thing after I do that, what I typically do is I change to some sort of soft tissue window. So here we have close to a soft tissue window, and pretty much what you're just looking here, is there any type of you know, scalp uh, swelling or hematoma? You know, we have a little bit along the frontal temporal um, soft tissues. This is a little bit asymmetric compared to the right, so that's gonna be some type of you know, soft tissue swelling. Maybe they hit their head. That's just gonna give us a good indication of being able to really focus in on that particular location for any type of fracture, any type of bleed, or any type of underlying etiology. After that, I'm going to be changing it to a bone window. Um, and really what you're going to be looking here is you're going to be looking for any type of fracture, being sure that you don't confuse it for any just normal suture, especially when you're dealing with kids. As uh, so you just want to look globally, this is also a good view in terms of bone window of looking at the sinuses. So looking at the ethmoids, phenoid, maxillary, and then the frontal sinuses, all of which were, have some degree of uh, mucosal thickening and sinusitis. And then you're going to be wanting to look, what I like to do is I kind of break it up into four. So I look at kind of the uh, frontal temporal bones and then kind of going backwards into the occipital bones and down inferiorly and then kind of working my way up in the left, um, I guess, lower quadrant, if you will, and then going into our left upper and then always looking at the base of the skull and then also looking at the, you know, the lateral masses and occipital condyles. So, and, and then also looking at for mastoid diffusions and just generally at the temporal bones. Obviously, this is not going to be the most ideal for looking at temporal bones, but really looking for any type of major abnormality here. Next, what I typically do is I change over to a brain window, and this is just going to give me a good overview now. Before we kind of looked at this, when we're just kind of scrolling more superficially, but I like to switch over to a brain window specifically and doing that again, looking at it in, in quadrants. So I'll go in and look at the top quadrant, then I'll go into the, you know, the bottom right, then the bottom left and then the, the top left. And you know, usually I'm scrolling a little bit slower to, to really uh, look and compare, because then after that what I'll do is I'll break it up into thirds or even halves and I'll compare in terms of symmetry. So I'll start with the top third and compare. What my eyes are looking at is I'm kind of focusing on the fox right here, but obviously in my peripherals I'm, I'm comparing to see uh, the other sides to see if there's any abnormality. And going up there, then going down, and then going posteriorly. What I'll also do is subdural, subarachnoids, uh, hemorrhages typically like to either go within the sulci, but also just kind of in the extra axial space. So they like to hug these corners. So what I'll do is I'll make another pass where all I'm doing is looking really extra axially to see if there's any type of hemorrhage. And so in addition, you're also looking within the sulci. If they're particularly visible in this young patient, they're not going to be as visible, but you know, you're going to be want to look if there's any hemorrhage kind of going along the sides and then going along the sides there. The next thing I'll do is I'll change it to a subdural window, you know, a hemorrhage window where really what this is looking for is 
hemorrhages are going to show up a lot better, right? Before we were just on a typical brain window, but here is really going to be having that good contrast where the brain as a whole is kind of more diffusely dark. So, you know, more newer acute hemorrhages are going to poke out a little bit more and going to be a little bit brighter if they're acute, um, uh, kind of in this periphery. So that's where, where I'm looking at now. I'm going to do the exact same thing where I'm going to be breaking up into quadrants and then always not forgetting kind of looking at the, you know, the tentorium or looking for subarachnoids in your basal system. That's a, a big blind spot because you can have gigantic subarachnoids if you're not looking, you know, where the circle of Willis is or within these basal cisterns. You know, you could be missing some big subarachnoid hemorrhages. But that's typically what I'm going to be doing is going to be looking for hemorrhages on this particular window and just going up and down, kind of looking more towards the periphery, but also, you know, more centrally as well. But typically, hemorrhages like to at least subdurals, which are going to be the things that you're going to be seeing most commonly, are going to be kind of hugging the sides and while you're looking at that you'll be seeing kind of more central issues as well. And then finally, what you're going to be looking for is strokes. In every single patient, no matter whether or not they come in for a stroke or whether they're not here for a stroke, you're going to want to make sure that you look at things in a stroke window specifically. And so what this really brings out is the gray-white differentiation. So remember on a CT scan, it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, things that are white are actually your gray matter. Things that are dark are going to be your white matter. Just remember that white matter is the things that are you know myelinated. They're the things that are going to be more central because they're bringing in all the you know the activity from the rest of the body up towards you know your cortex so remember it however you want but just remember that it's kind of opposite so when you're looking for strokes what you're really looking for is a few different things one you're looking for some type of edema you're looking for gray white loss of gray white differentiation you're looking for some type of hypodensity you're looking for some type of you know social effacement from the edema you're going to be looking for specifically you're going to be looking where you may be most interested in and I'll talk about this in another video of your aspect score but you know if you've ever looked at aspect score you'll see that these hemorrhages typically like to hug you know very specific locations you can see them anywhere but really your highest yield is going to be really centrally so you know you're going to be looking at the caudate the, the insula in particular you're going to be looking at your thalamus um, your internal capsule globus pallidus and your lentiform nucleus um, and then also don't forget the cerebellum is for some reason also a, a blind spot for me and also you know the, the occipital lobes as well the bigger larger infarcts that are involving you know large areas of the frontal or parietal or temporal lobes to be honest those are a lot easier to see the ones that are going to be the more difficult ones and the ones that you're going to be easier to miss but you really have to pay attention to are going to be the ones that are involving more centrally you know in terms of the basal ganglia and kind of the more central structures also don't forget the brain stem but to be honest in terms of a ct you can either look past uh, infarcts of the brainstem very easily or you can also overcall infarcts of the brainstem very easily. So that's going to be a little bit of a more dicey situation. Really what you're looking for with CT scans is, and the number one thing that I want you to take out of this, when you're looking at strokes or when you're looking at anything, to be honest, you're really trying to make sure there's nothing abnormally wrong. Once there's something that kind of piques your interest, you're going to need to get an MRI after that because CT really just kind of picks up major abnormalities. But really if you're looking, for example, let's take a stroke, for example, Really what you're looking for, is there any type of large vessel infarction, right? Is there some type of dense MCA sign? Do you see some large infarct that's involving, you know, the entire frontal lobe that you do not want to miss? And more specifically, are you seeing any type of hemorrhage, right? Because ultimately, they're either going to be doing one of two things. One, they're not quite sure they're going to get MRI. In that, you're just going to be looking very specifically at certain sequences, which I'll talk about later. Or they're going to be giving TPA. And the one thing you don't want to be doing is giving TPA in a situation where patient has a bleed. So that's really what you're trying to rule out in terms of a head CT. And so the last thing that I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking at everything in the coronal as well as the sagittal plane. Unfortunately, I don't have an example for you to kind of scroll through and walk you through it. But essentially, more globally speaking, I'm going to be doing the same thing where I'm going to be looking 
you know, specifically there's certain things on the coronal and sagittal plane that you're going to really want to look for on the coronal plane. A lot of times hemorrhages are going to look a lot more obvious. Also, any type of herniation, like for example, uncle herniation is going to be a little bit more obvious there. And in addition, whenever you see some type of finding, if you only see it in the axial plane, you can't see it in the coronal or sagittal uh, fairly obviously, then it may potentially be some type of artifact or misregistration. So you always want to make sure that whatever you're seeing before, you're seeing also in the coronal or sagittal and then in terms of sagittal plane the uh, you know the big things for for that are going to be you know looking for things that are more central structures so it gives you a much better look not only at the brainstem, you know pituitary gland uh, a lot of the ventricles so third and fourth ventricle are going to appear a lot uh, easier in in that plane the other thing that you really don't want to miss is some type of you know downward herniation it's very easy to look past some type of herniation here maybe it might be a little bit uh, full within the framing magnet but it will be much more obvious on the sagittal plane be sure to check out our website, medicalbasics.com, for more educational resources like our medical ID cards, scrub notes, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.